Hello, I'm Jeremy Dunn. This is Team 14, Case Rocket Team, participating in the 2021 Spaceport America Cup. This year, we're presenting our launch vehicle, nicknamed Phalanx, and a functional payload, nicknamed Aegis. Our launch vehicle is participating in the 10,000-foot COTS category. Our launch vehicle is unique in that it comes equipped with the ability to eject a payload and comes with an active apogee adjustment system. Our payload is unique in that it is equipped with a parafoil and will attempt to guide itself to a pre-designated landing target. Hi, I'm Miles Smith and I'm the Air Structure Sub-Team Lead. The purpose of the rocket is to bring a payload to 10,000 feet. When the payload is ejected, the nose cone and the body tubes have independent recovery systems. Failings consists of a lower section, a recovery section, an e-bay, an upper section, and a nose cone. The lower section consists of the fins, air brakes, and lower body tube. Next, we have the recovery section, which is attached using a coupler from the lower body tube to the recovery tube. Shear pins are used in the coupler and the recovery tube so that the recovery tube can come off of the lower body Body tube at Apogee. Above that, we have the eBay, which is also connected using the coupler. However, there are bolts in there and does not detach from the recovery tube. Above the eBay, we have the upper body tube, which is attached using bolts as well and does not detach from the eBay. Above the upper body tube, we have the nose cone, which is where the payload is located, as well as the nose cone recovery system. The goal of the air brake system is to reduce the apogee of the rocket to be as close to the 10,000 foot target as possible. To have greater control over the braking characteristics of the vehicle, a variable deployment mechanism was designed for the air brake system. The air brakes module has two main components. Up at the top above the motor, we have a system of linkages, including a stepper motor, motor controllers, and an encoder. The stepper motor is used to enable fine control over the deployment of the air brakes and control the braking force of the rocket during flight. Connected to that, we have four rods going down the length of the lower body tube all the way to the lower module, which has the mechanical linkages for the flaps that deploy at the bottom. In order to deploy the actual system would have to pull up on the rod. This is all controlled through a flight computer that records the flight characteristics of the vehicle and tries to estimate what the natural apogee of the vehicle is and through the use of algorithms determines the braking force required to reduce that apogee to the target 10,000 foot. One design challenge we set out to solve when making the air brake system was to maintain the stability of the vehicle during all phases of flight. To do so, we decided to place the braking element below the center of pressure of the vehicle. Therefore, when the air brakes were deployed, the stability of the rocket would only increase and never decrease during deployment. We can calculate based on our geometry of our fins, the fin flutter velocity. Looking at the graph, we can see our flutter velocity plotted over altitude. We observe that our flight velocity is significantly below the flutter velocity for our altitude that we experience max velocity. For the rocket, our fins will be mounted using fiberglass fin layup, where we will place fiberglass fabric on top top of cores. Upon putting a single layer, we will place epoxy, let it dry, and place more layers of epoxy and fiberglass on top for the added rigidity and strength. The electronics bay houses our altimeters, our GoPro, and our GPS. One problem when we were testing was that the electronics bay wasn't pressure sealed enough, and it was interfering with the altimeter's altitude readings. We decided to get rid of the tabs on the electronics sled that used to go through the bulkheads, and and now it mounts onto our threaded rods and kind of floats between the bulkheads so that everything is much more pressure sealed. For the test rockets, the most unique and interesting parts would be that we CNC'd a lot of weight relief in the eBay bulkhead so that it would be a lot lighter. And then another difficult aspect was the camera shield, which we ended up using a laser cutter to cut that and then hand drilled in the radial bolt pattern. The eBay coupler and the eBay bulkheads are also keyed, so a notch had to be cut into the coupler fairly precisely so that it all fit together well. We push the camera forward from the center of the rocket to get it in better frame. We work around how close should it be to the coupler to have a good view. Some of the challenges that we saw were the camera hole that we did in the coupler was a round hole, but then the camera didn't record in a circular ratio, so we had a few edges that we could see the video. At Apogee, the nose cone ejects from the upper body tube and the payload deploys. Shortly after that, the shear pins between the rear recovery tube and lower body tube shear, and the drogue deploys from the recovery tube. The drogue then carries the recovery tube and lower body tube to an altitude of 1,250 feet, where then the tenant descendi releases the main chute. Prior to launch day, we calculate the amount of black powder needed for each charge well, and then we assemble 
assemble the entire rocket and perform rejection tests. So we test each compartment independently, as well as the flight computers. We run a simulation using the flight computer to ignite the E-matches in the specific charge wells uh, where the black powder is located, as well as in the Tenny Descendi to make sure that our black powder amounts are accurate and will work well in flight to deploy our parachutes. The nose cone of the vehicle is independently ejected. This design was chosen based off test results from previous rockets in which our ejected payload showed a tendency to tangle with the nose cone during recovery. As the nose cone is independently ejected, this reduces the chance of tangling with the payload during recovery. The nose cone is equipped with its own electronics, including redundant recovery flight computers, as well as a GPS for tracking. It had its own drogue chute, which was very small, and a main chute, so it descent hit the ground at the correct velocities. And then you're going to have, at a preset altitude, a tender descender fire and release our main parachute. One of the trade-offs in this design is that by decreasing the likelihood of the payload tangling with the nose cone, we've increased the complexity of the recovery of the rocket. Hello, I'm Mackenzie Crow. I am the payload lead for our Ezra team of the Space Port America Cup. We designed the autonomous guided payload, Aegis, to be a rapidly recoverable scientific payload. Our goal was to create a deployable payload that had the functionality of being able to guide itself back to either a launch point or a designated point on the ground. The thinking behind this was that due to the payload containing sensors and various other data collection devices, we want to be able to recover this in a very convenient and easy fashion without reducing the risk of us losing it as a result of um, it landing in a naked spot. The main components of our payload are our parachute bay, which contains our drogue chute and parafoil, our electronics bay, which contains our flight computers, and our sensor bay, which contains a camera and GPS module. The payload electronics bay is designed to control two main things, the recovery event and the parafoil control. In order to do that, we have a few important electronics in there. The main control board, which is responsible for activating the nichrome to trigger the parafoil deployment, as well as taking data and controlling the servos. We also have a backup board that only has the ability to trigger the nichrome just to ensure that we have a second recovery event. The nichrome board can take inputs from both the main and backup boards. It has a signal that tells it when to fire the nichrome and it has continuity as well. The board itself actually has two distinct nichrome outputs, both of which will be looped around the piece of nylon thread holding the parafoil bag in place. During testing, we found that it was very easy to make a payload that was very difficult to assemble or work in at all. And so ease of assembly and ease of use was a big goal. The sled is entirely removable even when the frame is completely assembled, thanks to removable shields on either side of the eBay. Removing those allows the sled to just slide out with all the electronics on it. Our sensor bay is mainly composed of a 3D printed sled that slides in and out of the bottom section of the payload and is retained by the two shields. The sled itself is made to contain the GPS module and the GoPro camera. The the sensor in this case is the camera itself used to record our flight as well as be able to view recovery events after the fact. It's also designed to be modular. We could 3D print a different sled that could contain any number of sensors we want. The parachute bay contains both the servos and the nichrome deployment mechanism, which allows the parafoil to be deployed after a certain delay from Apogee. The servos are there to actuate the control lines, which are connected to either end of the parafoil, which allow the payload to guide itself. The drogue chute plus the nichrome fire mechanism was selected due to the inherent reliability of a nichrome mechanism and the ability to make it redundant quite easily simply by adding additional cables, which can then be burned out by the nichrome fire. Parafoil is a series of airfoil sections. Specifically, we went with an NACA 4418 that act as ribs in a semi-rigid wing that's inflated by air. It's made up of three key parts. There's the top skin, the bottom skin, and then the various ribs. The parafoil is suspended by a series of lines. Our parafoil is a five-cell parafoil. That means that it has six sets of lines. There are the three key sections of the lines that connect it to the payload, the suspension lines the cascade lines and they hook into the risers so those are adjusted in order to get to our set angle of attack that we have built into the parafoil to achieve our desired glide ratio and descent velocity so the payload has four risers on it they're made of flat braided nylon with clasps hooked into it the slider that comes up holds all the lines in place so they don't get tangled 
And as when air moves into the parafoil, the slider gets pushed down. And then those risers hook into our payload onto its hard points. The parafoil itself is kind of a difficult shape to manufacture. In order to cut our ripstop nylon, we used a fine soldering iron tip that was able to very easily melt the ripstop. And it also helps avoid frayed ends. They'd all be sewn from the bottom of the rib onto the bottom skin. Once all those were sewn on, we'd sew one by one those onto the top skin. From there, we needed to get the lines attached. Before the actual parafoil, itself, we did some validation of our deployment method for it, as well as our packing methods. We mostly practiced with elliptical chutes for that to ensure that our payload wouldn't drift too far away and have difficulty being recovered. And then with the parafoil itself, we mostly did testing on inflation, making sure it inflated as we'd expected, full-up testing of assembly, the end of the various parts like the slider, the deployment bag, how it interacted with the drum chute. The control board on the payload is monitoring the position acceleration and heading of the payload using the GPS and IMU on board, as well as controlling the servos that change the bank angle. We split up the landing into two different stages to reduce the development time and computational complexity of our guidance algorithm. But once we reach a altitude of 10,000 feet, the payload is ejected. After that, the circular holding phase begins and the payload descends in, in that phase until it is facing towards the target and within an accepted range of distance. Once that happens, we generate a sinusoidal path that we follow using a path pursuit algorithm. We use the GPS to track the position for our PAD controller. First, we needed a way to develop and test what we were going to make. So we made a physics simulator that acted as a testing environment. Our second big constraint was the lack of computational power of our microcontroller. So we dealt with that by making fairly simple algorithms. In our simulations, wind impacted the accuracy significantly. Dealing with that was, was quite challenging. We addressed it by using adaptive path following with the peer pursuit algorithm. We decided to use a sinusoidal path for the final descent because it's easy to alter the length of a sine curve. So that makes it really easy to generate different paths. The first step for assembly is wiring the eBay, and then after that, we attach it to the recovery tube and pack the parachutes in the recovery tube. It starts with just checking continuity and going through all the necessary checks and double checks in order to make sure none of our mechanisms will fail. This is finalized by us inserting the eBay slit back into the electronics bay and then screwing on the shields. The main chute gets packed into a deployment bag, and the drogue chute is then placed in the coupler between the lower body tube and the recovery tube. The lower body tube is then attached to the recovery tube and shear pins are screwed into the tubes. The upper body tube is already attached to the eBay so then we just place the payload into the upper body tube and then the nose cone on top of that. The payload parachutes go inside of the nose cone as well as the parachutes for the nose cone. We then screw in shear pins to the upper body tube to attach the nose cone. After the rocket is assembled it is carried out to the launch pad where the e-match is put into the motor. On the launch pad will be inserting the payload into the rocket. There is a payload ring at the top of the rocket in which the payload is then placed into. It has cheap corner pieces so that doesn't rotate flight and stable while it's in the rocket. After the E-match is ignited, the motor burns, and after motor burn, the rocket is in coast phase. In coast phase, the air brakes deploy and will decrease the apogee to 10,000 feet. At apogee, the payload and nose cone are ejected, and the recovery for the rocket begins. At 1,250 feet, the main chute deploys, and shortly after that, the rocket hits the ground. The payload is pulled out of the rocket by the drogue chute, which is on top of the payload and it will then begin to descent under drogue after a certain time. It will then switch to its parafoil, which will be caused by the firing of the nitro fire mechanism. After its parafoil is deployed, it will then begin guidance so that it can return to its designated point on the ground. While the payload is descending on its parafoil, it will go through a process of looking for its landing point, entering a holding pattern after a certain amount of time, bidding its final descent towards its target. This has been the Team 14 entry into the 2021 Spaceport America Cup, Phalanx and Aegis. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you at the competition.